After the box office storm that was Tim Burton's Alice, though, really this was more down to convenient timing given it, well, was released right after Avatar, and the 3D fantasy craze was at its absolute pinnacle, it was only natural for Disney to take another beloved fantasy property and make a big budget film out of it. In fact, a Disney Oz film had been pretty much in development since the days of Walt himself, and despite a couple of interesting efforts like Return to Oz, the project never got proper steam until, well, 2013 when we got Sam Raimi's Oz the Grey and Powerful. Now, much like a lot of Disney productions in the last, I'd say, four or five years, it drew a pretty mixed response. People praised it for its visuals, for its heart, and for some great moments of humor. But then criticism was leveled at the acting, the tone, certain issues with the structure, and probably most notably, the villains. Specifically a twist related to one of the villains. Now, I try not to just sound like a parrot of the critical consensus. I often try to, you know, put in my own perspective, and of course, that's part of the reason why you're watching this show. Because you think, oh, I'm going to be, you know, the different guy who has a very unique perspective. No. This time, it's kind of like Tron Legacy. I like the film more than I didn't. But that being said, the critics, as reluctant as I am to ever say this, for the most part, hit the nail on the head. And there are a couple of key areas where I think the re film really does drop the ball. Frankly, that whole element with the villain twist, which I won't spoil here for those of you who may not have seen the film yet, but it was just so unbelievably weak. And the actress that ends up being the Wicked Witch of the West, I'm not, again, not going to spoil who, but bless her cotton socks, or in this case, stockings, because, you know, she's a witch. She is trying her absolute heart. She is acting her heart out. She is trying to put as much energy as she can. And love, I'll give you points for trying, but you just don't cut it. This person just doesn't have the range or the experience yet to pull off a role like this. And as a result, a lot of it just feels really forced and hokey. And she just, she just can't pull off the sort of delicious mad evilness. Even if you put the original Wicked Witch from the 1939 film out of the way, or any of the other witches that have come before, it's just not a very good performance on its own merits. It doesn't have enough of a panache, a zest to it. It doesn't feel bigger than life. It doesn't have a sort of mad, eccentric wackiness to it, but also at the same time a very sinister edge. It just feels really pedestrian and... Though she does try her hardest, she just doesn't cut it, and I have no idea why Sam thought this was a good idea. I mean, for the first half, when she's just a, her regular self, it works fine enough, but then when she becomes the witch, no. Not at all. And just the whole twist that leads up to this of her transforming into the Wicked Witch... I wouldn't have a problem with it, but they treat it like a proper full plot twist. Like, oh, I bet you didn't see this coming. Come on, everyone looked at the poster, saw the trailers, it didn't take much of a genius to figure out who was going to end up being it. I wouldn't have minded if they just sort of built it up gradually and made it more character based, but here they treat it like a full twist, like a full like, oh this is something you've never seen before and I'll bet you never saw coming. And I just, I don't know why the writers and Sam thought this was a good way to approach this. People looked at the cast list and said, yep, I know who it is. Because frankly, it's not going to be her, it's not going to be her, so it has to be this person. If they had just focused a little more and maybe just made it more of a gradual thing, more of a development that had a more organic flow instead of just, oh, here she is one minute and bam, there she is, she's the Wicked Witch, it would have worked a lot better for the film. And once again, on top of the twist, much like Tron Legacy, the middle is probably the weakest part of the film. However, it's not as slam on the brakes, just dead as Legacies was. Here we actually get some nice bits of humor between our three main leads, Oz, his monkey helper, and the little China girl, which by the way, as a positive to the film and one that I do agree on with many people, she is probably the most touching and moving character I have seen in family films in a long time. 
She is like something out of a Miyazaki film. She's a lovely little China girl. The actress is just, she gives her such a sweetness, but also a pep to her. And she's just, the moment she's on screen, you just, you feel really warm and touched by her. I have to give full props to Raimi for just picking the right people to bring this together. And for the writers for just, even when they messed up on the villain front, they came back with our main characters and they made her really likable and even Oz himself yeah he's a womanizer and a bit of a well dick but in the end he sort of comes around and he actually becomes well a decent person and James Franco actually pulls this off really well I mean yes when you think about the fact that both Depp and Downey Jr were considered for this role he does sort of feel like the last minute replacement but he's like that last minute replacement on a lucky opening night at a theatre show. He just, he pulls it together. And I think he has grown a lot as an actor in recent years. And he definitely brings a likability to the film. And indeed that could summarise my whole sentiments on the film itself. It's just a likeable film but not much more than that. But before I get into more of the positive aspects to wrap things up, I'm just going to quickly cover another couple of things that I just, I couldn't quite get behind. One of which is sometimes the CGI. Now, for the most part, it looks fine. It's bright. It's colorful. You can definitely see nods to the 39 film in there. But there are a couple of times, in particular the first time when he gets to Oz and he lands in the river. Who the hell said that CGI was finished? It looks so garish and rubbery and it just, it feels like someone accidentally turned the saturation and contrast controls too high on the rendering program because it just... It was just unbelievably just so in your face, but not in a good way where you were just like, wow, this world is coming alive. It's like, what the hell, man? Turn it down. And because at first it has sort of that rubbery feel, you can tell it's just Franco standing in front of a green screen with the camera spinning around him. Whoever was in charge of polishing up that sequence didn't do a really good enough job to properly bring the two elements together. And so for a big budget production like this, for someone like Raimi who's worked with these sorts of effects before, it just feels really sloppy. It's like, really? Did you run out of time? Was Disney really this desperate to push this out on release date that they couldn't have maybe given you a few, maybe a day or two more to just finish tweaking it? And then also there's the opening, which frankly does work fine. And I like what Raimi wanted to do, making a throwback to the 39 film, but it feels too on the nose from a critical standpoint. As I'm watching it, I don't really mind it, but now that the film is done and I've allowed it to sink in, it just it feels like a too on the nose reference. It's like, well, it's odd, so this is what people expect. However, at the very least, there's a justification for it in the story to show the contrast between Kansas and Oz. So I can forgive it, even though it may be a reference that's a little too blatant and obvious and borders a little bit on stealing but well at least you can tell that there is a commitment and a charm to the film that it's willing to go for it's not just trying to be another cynical cash grab but even so with those elements aside which you know did cripple the film at points and make me think oh god please don't be another alice this wasn't another alice this didn't try hard to be some kind of big bloated epic fantasy that it didn't need to be. At points it did come close to that, but Raimi managed to rein it in, and indeed there are a lot of elements that I do like. The effects for the most part are still good and recapture that technicolor magic. I think most of the performances are fine, and of course Rachel Weiss is a lot of fun as always, and uh, the supporting roles are all played really well and the actors are clearly having a ball just playing off of each other. And of course then there's the obligatory Bruce Campbell cameo which as always is pretty awesome. And even then, I for the most part found myself into it, particularly the beginning and the ending. The middle, again like a lot of recent Disney features, is sort of where it stumbles down and I have no idea why this keeps being a continuous problem. But even so, as far as these types of reimaginings and prequels go, Oz wasn't as big of a disaster as I kind of expected it to be. It had a couple of really silly errors in it that even now I still think, who said this was a good idea? I still give the point to Lone Ranger as far as the big 2013 Disney films go, just because of its ideas and its ambition. 
but it managed to do more than I expected it to, and it came out swinging. 